Let's talk more about the Fed and bring in Mike Wilson, Chief U.S. Equity Strategist at Morgan Stanley. Mike, great to have you with us. Thanks, Melissa. Um, your, your bull case, just to remind our viewers, 3,700, um, but you say the most likely scenario would be a range of 3,350 to 3,700. Given what the Fed or what Jerome Powell specifically said today about think, not thinking about thinking about thinking about raising rates, do you think that the more likely scenario is closer to 3,700 at this point? Well, look, I mean, I think that, I mean, this policy that is, you know, being talked about today, this is not new, right? The Fed has been ultra dovish uh, since March. And, you know, quite frankly, they've been probably the most pessimistic economists out there that I've, you know, listened to. And I think part of that is a strategy uh, that allows them to remain extremely dovish. They want to make it perfectly clear that they're not going to stand in the way of this recovery. It's not going to be their fault if this recovery falters. And I think that's the right, you know, sort of stance for them to take at this point. Um, but, you know, uh, if you think about the upside for next year, it's not going to come from, you know, multiple expansion. We've already had that. It's going to come from earnings. And that's the story that I think folks are going to start to focus on next, which is that there's a lot of operating leverage in these business models now because they have cut costs so deeply, whether it be employment or SG&A or T&E or whatever. I mean, this stuff has come down dramatically. And so, you know, if the stimulus works and we get, you know, revenues to come back, there's going to be tremendous operating leverage stories. And that's what we're excited about for next year and even in the fall. And a lot of these stocks that have the most operating leverage are actually the stocks that have been underperforming for the last, you know, month and a half or two months as interest rates have come down. So we think the pendulum's going to swing back as people get more comfortable with the economy reopening. Um, I don't know if rates are going to shoot up or not, but ultimately they will. I think what Guy was talking about a minute ago on inflation is really important. That's probably a story for next year. And that's going to evoke more interest in these things that are actually positively related to nominal GDP and interest rates going up. And that's our, that's our positioning. So we like a barbell right now still of cyclical stocks, recovery stocks, paired up with kind of these COVID winners, which you know, seem to be defying valuation in the near term. Hey, Mike, and I appreciate your comments. Have you, is there a point on the chart where lower rates actually become a headwind? And, and furthermore, is there a point where you say, you know, this weakening U.S. dollar, which historically has been this great tailwind for multinationals, becomes sort of a headwind for an economy here that's obviously 73 percent driven by the consumer? Yeah, I think those are, are two really important points. So first of all, the, the bond market signaling from the nominal, you know, interest rate market is, is a false signal right now, right? I mean, those are being affected by what the Fed is doing and saying. So I'm focused on break-evens. I'm also focused on things like precious metals and other commodities, things that are telling us that actually there is some, you know, inflationary uh, buildup going on out there. And the weaker dollar is part of that story, guy. You, you hit the nail on the head. And, and I don't think it's a constraint now. Uh, but what I do think it does is it does challenge this Fed ultra dovish view. I mean, I think at some point they do care about the dollar if it were to fall out of bed, uh, because it will be inflationary. That'll put a constraint on them on the other side. Plus, they are supposed to be stewards of the currency at some level, right? I mean, I know that's the Treasury's job, but you know, we don't want to see the U.S. dollar fall out of bed completely. So I think that is going to be a constraining factor on their dovishness at some point later this year. Hey, Mike, you just mentioned, obviously, next year you're expecting operating leverage. Companies realized a lot of efficiencies, cost cuts, that sort of thing. So when you think about 2021, that's how you get to this multiple, not just based on expansion, but based on earnings growth. Here's the, here's the one issue that I, I kind of take with that argument is that we are seeing corporate America shed jobs that may not come back. That's part of that efficiency. So we're coming off of 3.5%, 60-year low unemployment, and we may be at high single digits, 10% unemployment for 2021. So how do you square that with what – I'm just thinking that at some point in the next few months, we are going to be talking about a double-dip uh, dip recession the same way we were talking in 2010 and 11. But this, this time it might happen because technology did it, the winners of the pandemic. Pandemic, the very the very ones that you just kind of mentioned also yeah look I mean we're not anticipating uh, unemployment back at where we were anytime soon it's gonna take multiple years but you know we do think unemployment will be making modest progress um, lower over the course of the next six to twelve months and I, I would gather that by the end of this year we're back in the single digits and then the recovery kind of begins but then as you know I mean that's that's when the operating leverage shows up I mean yeah, it's unfortunate that these folks are going to be out of work for another you know, few years, probably. You know, they'd love to get back to work, but it's going to take time. The economy is going to recover, and companies will be slow to hire folks back. And as long as the fiscal stimulus remains in place, which I think it will, I think these deficits are going to become more structural in nature, 
particularly if we have a blue sweep. And, and so, I mean, the revenue will come back. I mean, we've seen that already. It's been remarkable how fast, you know, people can find ways to spend the money in other ways that they can't go out to a restaurant or they can't do things that are, you know, big gatherings of people. They find other ways to spend the money. So I think that pump will continue to be primed. That's going to be where the revenue comes from, from a fiscal standpoint, and then the operating leverage will flow through. Mike, thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Mike Wilson, Morgan Stanley. Here's a weird would you rather. I don't think I've ever asked this question. Uh-oh. Um, I'll pose it to Bonoin. Wow, gets since it. He's, he, Bonoin, since he's the new guy. <laughs> uh, would you rather gold, Good luck, or, buddy. gold or equities right here? Oh, my goodness. The last time I played a game, I got myself in the <laughs> penalty box. So I'm a little <laughs> trepidatious here to even give you an answer. Um, gold. Wow. Gold. For all the reasons that everyone has touched upon. And I realize we are at nosebleed levels. But listen, this is this is not going away anytime soon. You know, um, you know, we talk about the effects of multinationals. We talk about weakness in the dollar. All of those things are going to contribute to what is now the the safe haven commodity. And if you look at sovereign sovereign yields globally, I mean, wh where else do you put the money? Um, equities, you're going to have to take a, a, a ton more volatility. It, particularly being that the new investment is going to be value or growth or recovery. So if I'm going to take shocks to the to the system, I'd rather mm -hmm. I'd rather own gold. 